Hello and welcome. Uh, welcome to all of the participants uh, here at Harvard uh, and in the wider world. Uh, my name is Gerald Newman. I'm a professor of international law and the director uh, of the Human Rights Program here at Harvard Law School. Uh, we're here today to talk about the resurgence of child labor in the United States uh, and the rights of the child. Many of us saw news coverage last spring about shocking increases in child labor in the United States, uh, but also about legislative efforts to undermine regulation of child labor in various states. And not only local efforts, but efforts that are part of a concentrated campaign to roll back protections. Now, clearly this is not the only human rights problem in the world today that deserves attention, but it is one that is occurring very close to home uh, and is our responsibility. And we think it is very important for us to talk about it, uh, which is why we've convened this panel today. Uh, for the United States, children working in factories sounds like a bad part of old history. Uh, in the 19th century and in the early 20th century, in fact, many students still learn about it in constitutional law, how the Supreme Court of the Lochner era struck down attempts by Congress to regulate child labor. Uh, and then after the New Deal, the modern court upheld those efforts to regulate. Harvard actually played a negative role in this story in the 1920s, uh, but I won't go into that now. Uh, the exploitation of child labor is not only a policy problem for the United States and a moral problem, uh, but it raises questions of international human rights law. International labor conventions address child labor including ILO Convention 182 on the worst forms of child labor to which the United States is a party. Article 24 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights to which the United States is also a party guarantees every child the measures of protection required by their status as a minor. Uh, and this is understood as addressing child labor among other issues. The Convention on the Rights of the Child has more explicit provisions on regulation of child labor. Now, the United States is the only UN member state that has not ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, but the United States has ratified the optional protocol to the Convention on the Rights of the Child on the sale of children. And the United States has obligations under that treaty that overlap with prohibitions of economic exploitation and trafficking of children. Uh, this legal sketch that I've given explains the choice of leading experts who will be exploring those issues with us today. Uh, in the order in which they'll be speaking, uh, first, uh, Terry Gerstein directs the State and Local Enforcement Project at the Harvard Center for Labor and a Just Economy. Uh, she's also a senior fellow at the Economic Policy Institute uh, and a former Open Society Foundation's Leadership in Government Fellow. Uh, previously, she worked for over 17 years enforcing labor laws, including as the Labor Bureau Chief in the New York State Attorney General's Office and as a Deputy Commissioner in New York State's Department of Labor. Benjamin Smith is the Chief is the senior child labor specialist of the International Labor Organization, the ILO, uh, where he supports member states in the development and implementation of policies and programs to tackle child labor. Uh, he previously served as a presidential management fellow with the United States Department of Labor's International Bureau of Labor Affairs. Uh, Benjamin David Mesmer is professor of law at the University of the Western Cape in South Africa, and he is a member of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child, uh, which monitors compliance with the, with the uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, and its protocols. Uh, 
Uh, he served also as the Special Rapporteur on Children in Armed Conflict of the African Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, and was recently an Eleanor Roosevelt Visiting Fellow uh, here at the Human Rights Program. Uh, after the three panelists have spoken, uh, there should be time for questions from the audience. Uh, and you can use the Q&A function on Zoom to submit questions. Uh, I will try to ask as many of them as time allows. Uh, later, after a bit of delay for processing, the recording of this event will be posted on the Human Rights Program's YouTube channel uh, and promoted through the Human Rights Program's newsletter. Uh, finally, I'd like to give thanks to the co-sponsors of this event, the Harvard Union of Clerical and Technical Workers, the Harvard Center for Labor and a Just Economy, uh, and the Harvard Law School Youth Advocacy and Policy Lab. Uh, with that, uh, let's get the exploration underway. I give the word to Ms. Gersti. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to share my screen because I have a PowerPoint that I'll be sharing. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about this today. My own background is domestic, and so my presentation is going to focus on these issues from a domestic, U.S., federal, and state um, perspective. Um, so first off, I thought it would be useful to give a brief summary of U.S. child labor laws in a nutshell. There are two main prohibitions at the federal level and in most states. One is that um, minors cannot be assigned to do hazardous work. There's a set of occupations under federal law, state laws that sometimes identify certain workplaces as particularly hazardous, and sometimes it's based on the job. But it's the, the it's a prohibition against children being required to do work that is dangerous. And then there are also prohibitions on hours, the time of day so that minors aren't working the night shift and the total number of hours they can work. At the state level, in a number of states, there are also requirements that minors have to obtain work certificates and employers have to confirm those. Um, and that allows students, teachers, and the employer and the government all to know that that minor is working. In terms of enforcement, a few key points. One is that it's all government enforcement. There is no private right of action. There are really modest civil monetary penalties. Um, at the federal level, the penalties are about $15,000. They max out in the $15,000 range. And there has been discussion among advocacy groups about the need to raise those. At the state level, they're often significantly lower than that. For example, in New York City, where I live and where I worked, the penalty, the civil monetary penalty for a first violation is $1,000, 2,000 for a second, and 3,000 for a third and subsequent. In some states, um, the penalties are like $100. In one state, it's $20. So the monetary penalties are really grossly insufficient to deter violations. There are some other tools that can be used. For example, the Fair Labor Standards Act, the federal minimum wage law that contains our child labor provisions has a hot goods provision that allows the Department of Labor to seek an injunction against the transport of goods that were produced in violation of child labor laws. Um, and that is something that the US Department of Labor has been using recently. Um, and then a final point is that there is not federal preemption of state laws. The Fair Labor Standards Act is a floor, not a ceiling. So states are able to be free to be more protective or less or not have any laws on this at all. Um, we have seen in recent years a real surge in child labor violations that I think has been pretty shocking to most of us. Um, the U.S. Department of Labor has had a 69% increase over the past five years. Uh, there's been media coverage in the New York Times of teenagers 14 and 15 years old working in meatpacking plants and construction sites, in food processing facilities, packaging Cheerios and more. Reuters um, did, uh, did an investigation and found children as young as 14 working in a, an auto supply manufacturer that was working for Hyundai. The Boston Globe has found minors working in fish processing plants. 
um, and more. And there have also been high profile cases by the federal labor department and state labor departments. The federal case that has gotten the most attention involves meatpacking plants um, for Tyson and JBS and other huge multinational meat companies um, that they were using a subcontractor, PSSI, Packer Sanitation, to do the cleaning and sanitizing, including on the night shift. And PSSI was hiring minors through use of staffing agencies. But there have also been child labor violations, for example, in fast food restaurants. Chipotle had extensive violations of the hours requirements and has paid about $9 million in penalties based on investigations by the Massachusetts, New Jersey, and DC attorney general's offices. Many of these cases, especially the worst, most egregious ones, involve immigrant children, um, but not all of them do. There are certainly cases. There was there are certainly cases where, like the Chipotle case, like some workplace injury or fatality cases that have involved um, minors who were born in the U.S. And then, meanwhile, we're seeing some conservative states rolling back or attempting to roll back child labor laws. Um, Arkansas removed the requirement of an employment certificate. Iowa passed a very confusing law that is going to put minors at risk by, in certain instances, allowing more prohibited work. Now, to understand why this is happening, it's useful to look at the overall context. And part of the context I want to share, my background is in labor, um, is that there are there's a high rate of violations overall in workplaces in the U.S. This is not just child labor. And there are tons of numbers and statistics I could share, but in the interest of time, I'll just note that these violations include violations of minimum wage laws, workplace safety and health, discrimination. When workers try to organize and form a union, they are frequently retaliated against and fired, and there are violations of the law. And in fact, workers who try to exercise their rights are often retaliated against. So in terms of the context, there are many, many different ways to frame the context. There's the context of immigration law. There's the context of the you know hollowing out of human services agencies. There's the context of U.S. foreign policy in Central America. I'm going to talk about the context in terms of labor and employment law and developments in relation to the workplace. And I'm going to talk about three trends that have been going on for decades that really set the stage for this to happen. One is the decline in union density in the U.S., Another is underfunded enforcement agencies. And the third is the so-called fissuring of the workplace. And with all of these, you know, if we had higher union density, if we had robust enforcement, if we had lead corporations actually taking responsible for workers who are on their job sites doing, doing work on their products, um, these kinds of violations would be much less likely to happen. So the first trend, the decline in union density, in the 1950s, around a third of the private sector workforce was unionized, and now it's about 6%. In surveys, about 50% say they would like to be. And this results from several factors. One, people have written whole books about this, but basically the National Labor Relations Act um, is too weak and is often violated. What does this have to do with child labor? When there's a union on a job site, there's an on-site monitor of the union steward or representative who sees what's going on. Unions empower workers to report violations um, without fearing um, retaliation. Oops, sorry, I went back up, I went forward a page. Um, also, unions, um, sorry about that. Also, unions play a really important role in relation to as as political actors. Um, they lobby for stronger laws. They also lobby and push for more enforcement resources. The second major trend I want to talk about is inadequate enforcement funding. Um, the U.S. Department of Labor Wage and Hour Division enforces the child labor laws, but also minimum wage, overtime, Family and Medical Leave Act, a number of other laws. About a year ago, they had 800, around 800 investigators for the entire country, which is around 400 fewer than in the late 1970s, and is really insufficient for addressing the needs. The OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, has about 900 inspectors, and that is enough to investigate each workplace once every 190 years. <clears throat> 
State enforcers also have similarly um, pinched resources. Um, a Politico study found that seven have zero wage and hour investigators and um, over 30 have fewer than 10. And then there's the fissured workplace. This is um, this is a term used to describe corporations that are avoiding directly employing people who perform core elements of the work. And instead they use business models that insulate them from having an employment relationship. Contracting, subcontracting, outshoring, using staffing agencies or temp agencies. And this leads to more violations and worse working conditions. At the top of the chain in the lead corporations, you have large multinationals that are more organized and above board, that have general counsel, they have an HR, they have profit margins. When you go down to the bottom of the chain, you have smaller, less organized entities with fewer resources. Um, and each layer in a, in a supply chain or in the fissured model has to make some profit or take a cut, which leads some to cut corners. It's much harder to enforce the law in a fissured structure. Um, in the US, there is a concept of joint employment, but it's very hard. Um, it's not impossible, but it is like threading a very difficult needle to actually get joint employment status. The Fair Labor Standards Act defines employee as to suffer or permit to work, which is a very broad definition, but the case law has really narrowed that and looked much more carefully at the exact relationship between that worker and that employer and who's supervising and who's paying. And so some of these major cases that have come to light have occurred in fissured workplaces. PSSI, there were the major meatpacking corporations that hired PSSI and then PSSI used staffing agencies to hire the teenagers. Also, there were the New York Times story talked about a, um, teenagers working in a Cheerios processing plant. It's a similar situation there. So the lead corporations are really insulated from responsibility for the workers. At the same time, they're the entity with the real ability to prevent violations. They can do more due diligence before they subcontract. They can monitor conditions. They can make compliance a material term of the contract um, with consequences like we will break the contract right away if you violate the law. And they can also take the work in-house. It is not a law of nature that all corporations have to constantly subcontract. And in the case the USDOL brought, um, JBS, the meatpacking company, actually opened its own sanitation and cleaning unit, directly hiring the employees to do this work, and had a contrast, now has a contract with UFCW, with the, a union. So these jobs, which were being done by teenagers, totally unsafe, inappropriate jobs for kids, are now being done by union workers. So now I'm just going to go very quickly through some laws or policies that could help in this area. Um, you know, some of them are, you know, real possibilities. Some of them maybe, you know, are a little bit more um, thought exercise. But one point that I always try to emphasize talking in the U.S. is that um, the federal government is not the only avenue and that states can take a lot of action and localities in some cases, too. So one law that would really help is facilitating more unionization and updating our um, National Labor Relations Act. There's a law in Congress, the PRO Act, that would do this and that would eliminate many of the barriers. Um, more enforcement resources sort of goes without explanation. It's very clear um, that we need resources among enforcers to do this work. Greater civil monetary penalties uh, many people are focusing on this, but I'll just note if we have higher penalties alone without more enforcement, the penalties are less relevant because people won't think they have much of a chance of being caught. And then we need easier ways to hold lead corporations liable for violations in their supply chains. There are some laws to this effect at the state level in relation to construction, for example, where the, the general contractor is liable for violations by subs, and they can later seek indemnification from the subs um, if there are violations. Another thing that I have thought of is, you know, the lead corporations often say, well, we had no way of knowing this was happening. So perhaps you could have a scenario where for a second or subsequent child labor violation in their supply chain, they would have strict liability because with the first violation, they're already on notice. Um, workers' comp policies are also a lever for deterring violations. In the U.S., there's a grand bargain of workers' compensation that workers can't file a tort lawsuit for damages, and in exchange, they get the certainty of having workers' comp insurance. 
There are some states that allow tort lawsuits if a minor is injured while child labor laws are being violated. The value, the deterrent value of this is that it massively increases employers' potential exposure and consequences if they violate the law. Publicity is something also that can help. Um, there was a study by a Duke professor of OSHA press releases, and he found that they significantly deterred safety and health violations by peer employers in the same industry and geographic region. Um, New Jersey Department of Labor this year started, they passed a law that creates a wall of shame where they list violators publicly. Procurement is also another tool, the basic concept that government contracting dollars should not go to businesses that flout labor laws. Um, there are a number of local governments that have passed wage theft ordinances that create contracting consequences for violators so the locality won't contract with them. And there's also a bill to this effect in the Senate in relation to the US Department of Agriculture. Requiring work permits for minors in any states that don't provide them. You know, I think sometimes that those states that have uh, removed them, like Arkansas, it seemed like a technicality or burdensome. But it, this this um, is an example of the Massachusetts application for a work permit for a minor. And you can see that the employer has to include the minor's job duty, primary job title, primary duties, the number of hours. And the, the application itself has a summary of all of the child labor laws on it. And a number of states, I've looked at Hawaii and Oklahoma and Washington State, Massachusetts, the work permit applications do provide play an educational purpose. Mandating workers' rights education is another would be another useful tool. Um, most adults don't know their rights at work. I think people are expected to learn it by osmosis. Um, but California just passed a law designating a specific week as workplace you know, readiness week, and they're adding to the high school curriculum uh, training about child labor, wage and hour, at workplace safety, union rights, and other basic labor laws. And then several other policies I'll just highlight. One would be to create a private right of action, so it's not just the government that can enforce the law, and that would expand the pool of uh, enforcers. A whistleblower right of action could help as well. There were certainly coworkers who saw these violations happening um, and didn't have any avenue um, or job protection for, you know, didn't feel they had job protection for reporting them. Liquidated or compensatory damages for minors. Right now, when there's enforcement, the only thing that happens to a minor is they lose that job that they and their family need for income. Um, but if there were some kind of damages, that would be helpful. And then there are certain immigration related policies that could really help. Um, the nonprofit Kind Kids in Need of Defense has been arguing for a right to counsel for unaccompanied minors in immigration cases. If they had a counsel, that person would ob obviously be possibly someone who could spot these violations. And if minors had work authorization, um, if immigrant children had a more ready path to work authorization, they could get above board jobs with employers who are not violating all of these laws because our child labor laws do allow children over 14 to actually work. They just place the very modest and sensible safeguards that I mentioned at the beginning. My final thought, if we want to stop child labor in the United States, we really have to value both children and labor a lot more than we do. But at the same time, there are a lot of opportunities for positive action. So with that, I will stop and um, turn to our next, um, our next speaker. Thank you for that foundational description of the legal framework uh, and the situation on the ground uh, in the United States. Um, Mr. Smith. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon uh, to, to everyone. And big thanks to Harvard Law School for the invitation to be a part of this panel. It's a real pleasure for, for me. Um, just by way of a brief introduction to the ILO, uh, we are the UN agency for the world of work. Uh, our mission is social justice, and we're the only tripartite UN agency, meaning that governments, workers, and employers uh, have a seat on our, our board and, and uh, uh, the governance structure. So um, the ILO sets and monitors international labor standards and provides technical assistance to support uh, our member states to implement them. 
Now, the elimination of child labor is one of the fundamental principles and rights at work and has been on the agenda of the ILO from the beginning, uh, from, from the, its founding in, in 1919. Um, so during the, the time that, uh, that I have the, the floor, I'd like to do three things. First, set the scene globally and say a few words on the size uh, and nature of the problem worldwide. And then I'll speak about uh, vulnerabilities uh, globally that are relevant to the situation in the in the U.S. And then finally, I'll review what the ILO's supervisory bodies have that monitor compliance with our conventions have said about the, about the situation in the United States. So uh, in 2020, we registered the first increase in child labor since we began measuring it uh, 20 years before. Today, there are 160 million children engaged in child labor, almost one in 10 children worldwide. Half of them, 79 million, are in hazardous work that puts their health uh, safety and, and moral development in danger. In Asia and, and the Pacific and in Latin America and the Caribbean regions, we've seen progress uh, and child labor continued to fall even in this uh, most recent period from 26 to 2016 to 2020. Uh, we take a snapshot typically every, every four years of the global situation. However, in that period in Africa, child labor rose by 20 million, a 27% increase since 2016. And that increase is made up entirely of very young children. So between the ages of five and 11. Now, an additional 9 million children were at risk of being pushed into child labor by the end of 2022 as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but this is not something that we need to resign ourselves to this outcome. Uh, the pandemic, in fact, confirmed what evidence had already demonstrated, the direct and dramatic impacts, in many cases, of increased social protection on child poverty rates uh, and there, by extension, on preventing and eliminating child labor. And uh, this was, uh, uh, United States was one of those uh, countries where this was proven just clear clear as a bell. Um, okay, so in terms of sectoral distribution, 70% of child labor is in agriculture. So tens of millions of family farms that are functionally dependent on child labor to, to operate. 20% um, is in services, and that includes 4.5% uh, which is children in domestic work uh, and that's mostly girls um, the, who are uh, uh, involved in that. And then 10% is in industry. So it's really a, a, a rural phenomenon, uh, uh, largely. It's child labor rates in rural areas are three times higher than in urban areas. Um, most takes place within the families, about 72%. Um, so family-based child labor whether family farms or, or family micro enterprises is frequently hazardous. And this is despite um, common perceptions that uh, working within the family provides protection and it is somehow safer than, than work uh, elsewhere. Now, child labor is by no means restricted to low income countries. And this is the, the, the rationale for the panel today. Uh, most child labor, uh, in, uh, children in child labor live in middle income country, countries where pockets of poverty uh, and social, economic, and cultural marginalization of certain groups oftentimes play a role. So, to give you a couple of examples, uh, in Peru, child labor amongst indigenous children is almost three times higher than the average. And in Ecuador, indigenous children are 12 times more likely to be involved in hazardous work. In Guatemala, indigenous children reported that discrimination and marginalization by teachers and peers prompted them to drop out of school and to look for work elsewhere. So I mentioned that child labor is a, a fundamental principle and right at work. 
so is non-discrimination. And the links between those two are clear. Uh, other fundamental labor rights include freedom of association and collective bargaining. So I really appreciated uh, Terry's highlighting that, that link where workplaces are organized, you don't find child labor. And then uh, of course you have occupational safety and health and no forced labor as the other fundamental rights and countries, even if they don't ratify the conventions that underline those principles are still obligated to report on them uh, and uh, under because they are uh, fundamental labor rights and by virtue of their membership in the ILO. Um, so uh, another vulnerable group is migrant children, often without proper travel documents, uh, which makes them easy targets for exploitation or extortion. Uh, but of course, even though they lack papers, they are not illegal because people can never be illegal. While they may not have access to safe and regular migration, they don't leave their rights at the border, including their right to be free of child labor. So border crossings, transport hubs, uh, bus stations, railway stations, airports, those are recognized uh, points of risk for, for trafficking. And when children travel without their parents, it's very uh, obvious that they are much more vulnerable to harm and exploitation at all stages of, of migration. Some children uh, indenture themselves into debt bondage situations in order to raise enough money to migrate. And evidence shows that child migrants often experience maltreatment, including isolation, violence, substandard working conditions, non-payment of wages, and the threat of being reported to authorities. Migrant children receive less pay, work longer hours, attend school less often, and face higher death rates at work in comparison to local children who are in child labor. So just uh, uh, to be clear, child labor affects many, many more children than forced labor. So I wanted to kind of make a, that, that distinction uh, between child labor and, and the subset, which is child, ch child trafficking. So 160 million child laborers, there are about 3.3 million children in uh, forced labor. So to get the right policy response, it's really important to rely on international standards and definitions to understand the, the difference and apply that in law and to um, rely also on a solid evidence-based data uh, to avoid um, conflating those two. So I'd like to turn now to what the ILO supervisory bodies have said about the situation in the US. Uh, so uh, as was noted, the US has ratified uh, ILO Convention 182 on the worst forms of child labor. So their reports are, are scrutinized by our, our supervisory mechanism, in particular, an independent committee of experts. Uh, and they found in 2020 that the Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, and, and had found that previously as well, um, does permit children aged 16 years and above to undertake in the agricultural sector, occupations that are, have been declared to be hazardous uh, or detrimental to their health or well being by the Secretary of Labor. So, this is an issue because uh, the Convention 182 and the ILO's other Convention on Child Labor, which is not ratified by the US Convention 138 on minimum age, um, say that generally uh, 18 is the minimum age for hazardous work. So the committee also noted that according to the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, uh, agriculture ranked amongst the most dangerous industries. It was the sector with both the highest fatality numbers, 389 deaths from 1994 to 2013 uh, for all youth under 18, and amongst the uh, age range of 15 to 17 uh, was uh, that sector had the highest fatality rate. The Committee of Experts uh, also cited US Government Accountability Office report uh, 
uh, which uh, uh, found that five, well, five and a half percent of working children uh, worked on farms. Uh, agriculture was responsible for more than half of child occupational deaths. So between 2003 and 2016, 237 children died in farm-related work accidents in the U.S., and that is four times the number of deaths of any other sector. The committee also, uh, in addition to kind of um, uh, calling out gaps in uh, the application of standards also uh, recognizes progress and commends member states when, when progress does happen. And in the case of the U.S., it uh, took note of measures um, taken by the government to protect uh, health and safety of young workers in agriculture. Um, one uh, real, I think, important example was in 20, 2017 when uh, the government prohibited children from uh, under 18 from handling agricultural pesticides, one of the key, obviously, hazards uh, that, that can affect uh, children's development uh, uh, throughout the course of their life, uh, exposure to pesticides. Um, with regard to trafficking, um, things like the reauthorization of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act was noted, um, as well as hundreds of child trafficking victims um, rescued and thousands of criminal arrests and convictions. However, um, the, the committee has repeatedly uh, expressed concern that a significant number of children under 18 uh, still suffer injuries, uh, some serious while engaged in farm work. Uh, moreover, the statistical information shows that agriculture remains the most dangerous sector for children. The highest number of fatal injuries, uh, especially for those who work for family-owned businesses or perform um, uh, work that's not covered by child labor regulations. Um, now, since uh, one of uh, the things that I've, I'm doing in, in my in my time is to kind of set the global framework, um, I think it's important to say a word about the role of the U.S. in the in the global and the worldwide fight against child labor. So, um, since 2000, even counting the recent increase child labor has dropped by 86 million. So really remarkable, remarkable progress. Um, ILO Convention 182 uh, has achieved universal ratification. So this is a, a historic first uh, and, a, and a huge number of countries uh, have put in place policies and programs to prevent and address uh, uh, child labor. So the US has played a, a, a vital role in this as a development partner. Um, supporting uh, other countries, uh, including through the ILO's um, International Program on the Elimination of Child Labor um, in every region, supporting data gathering, um, policy development, and direct action to, to tackle child labor. So wanted to end on that, uh, that note. Um, and uh, over to you, Jerry. Thanks a lot. Thank you. It's, it's always nice to have a little good news in these human rights discussions. Uh, Professor Mesmer. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, I joined the previous speakers. It's uh, an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, so thank you for having me. Um, on the point of good news, so I I plan to go around my my inputs in three phases. First, I want to put in a disclaimer, uh, and then I'll say a few good news in terms of the substantive framework, uh, uh, and I will come to the not so good news, uh, which uh, I will reflect in relation to the. The US. In terms of the disclaimer, uh, I have the privilege to serve on the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. Uh, I've had the opportunity to be a reporter when the US government came uh, to the committee uh, reporting under the optional protocol on sale child prostitution pornography, but also the optional protocol on children in armed conflict. Uh, and those are very useful conversations. Uh, in fact, because the US is not a state party to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, that's our only opportunity uh, to engage the government of the US. So whatever I say here, obviously, uh, I'm not speaking on behalf of the committee. Uh, and secondly, the US government has actually submitted its fifth report uh, under the two optional protocols. Uh, and probably in the coming year or a year and a half, the government will be scheduled for review. So whatever I say here uh, is not a, a pre-review uh, of that report. And as you will see, uh, I will actually anchor most of my comments in relation to the previous uh, review. Now, the, the good news is 
The Convention on the Rights of the Child is actually a very solid instrument. Uh, it's actually helped us to address a number of uh, child rights issues, including the issue of child labor. Uh, as Benjamin rightly highlighted, uh, there has been significant progress, and particularly Article 32, which talks about the fact that uh, states recognize the right of the child to be protected from economic exploitation and from performing any work that is likely to be hazardous or to interfere with the child's education. This is important, to interfere with the child's education or to be harm harmful to the child's health or physical, mental, spiritual, moral, or sexual develop social development. That has been a very, very important provision. And following that uh, requirement of state parties to the convention, uh, states have to provide, uh, give relevant, uh, have to reg give regard to the relevant provisions of other international instruments. And we already made mention of uh, the ILO Convention 182 and 1138. States are also required under the Convention on the Rights of the Child to provide a minimum age or minimum ages for admission to employment. They have to regulate the hours and conditions of employment. They have to provide appropriate penalties. Uh, when Terry was mentioning some of those penalties, uh, that are actually being provided, I, 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 I was cringing because they are penalties, but they're not appropriate penalties uh, or sanctions that actually meet the gravity of the offenses that are actually being committed. But that's in connection with the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and the U.S. is not a state party to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So our we have used the provisions of the Convention on the Rights of the Child with countries that are lowering minimum ages. Uh, but Bolivia, for example, uh, ca comes to mind uh, for instance, uh, in their code, they allowed for children and adolescents aged 10 to 14 years to work in self-employment, which we took issue with. They also allowed in their law for children and adolescents aged 12 to 14 years uh, to work for a third party, which we also had some challenges with and so forth and so forth. So the convention has helped us to push the boundaries, but in the context of the U.S. government, it's not going to help us much because the U.S. is not a state party to the convention. Now, having said that, we have had occasions as the Committee on the Rights of the Child in 2016, 2017, even in subsequent, subsequent years, where there is a push by different civil society organizations. Uh, you know, the questions like, what works for working children is asked. Uh, or we have received letters that have been signed by hundreds of academicians and so forth, asking the committee to take a position to lower the minimum age. Uh, they view child participation and children's voices to almost be uh, not just only the critical, but the ultimate deciding uh, criteria uh, in lowering minimum ages. And as a committee, we've actually pushed back. Uh, and our position is very much aligned with what the position of the, the ILO is. Now, the optional protocol on sale, child prostitution, and child pornography is of, uh, is of some help, without a doubt, uh, because the U.S. has ratified it, but also because there are some important provisions. For instance, Article 2 talks about the fact that for the purpose of the protocol, sale of children means any act or transaction whereby a child is transferred by any person or group of persons to another for remuneration or any other consideration. It plays a bit of a role in addressing child labor, forced labor. Article three, which actually says, as a minimum, the acts that are provided in the protocol should be covered under its criminal or penal law, whether such offenses are com committed domestically or transnationally or on an individual or organized basis. And in fact, when it when it talks about sale of children and the fact that criminal law and penal law needs to have that in its content, it says sale of children as defined in Article 2, offering, delivering, or accepting by whatever means a child for the purpose of sexual exploitation of the child, transfer of organs, but under C, it says engagement of the child in forced labor. So that has been actually a very important uh, entry point for us uh, in our engagement uh, with the U.S. Now, it goes further than that, actually. It talks about criminalizing attempt, uh, complicity. Uh, it also tries to provide that the penalties uh, that are provided are appropriate, uh, not the minimal ones that were mentioned earlier. Uh, it also says that subject to the provisions of its national law, each state party shall take measures where appropriate to establish the liability of legal persons or for offenses established in the protocol. So that is absolutely important because legal persons uh, companies and so forth need to be held accountable, but there is also room for criminal, civil, or administrative accountability. So it's in a broader sense. Now, let me move to the U.S. context, which is the not so good news. As was already mentioned, the U.S. is the only guilty exception uh, as far as ratification of the option of the, as far as ratification of the Convention on the Rights of the Child is concerned. Uh, and our engagement as the Committee on the Rights of the Child is very much based on the optional protocol on sale, child prostitution, and pornography. It has its advantages, but it also has significant limitations. Now, when the U.S. prepares uh, these reports, uh, 
uh, in fact, it provides that uh, it draws from expertise from different stakeholders within the government. Uh, for instance, the Department of State, without a doubt, education, justice, health and human services, homeland security, uh, interior, but also labor, treasury, as well as the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, and the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. The last three or four that I mentioned are actually absolutely critical for our engagement when we speak to the government of the U.S., particularly in the context of uh, child labor. Now, child labor does not always neatly fit into the optional protocol, but as the committee, we try to do our level based. Now, let me mention a couple of limitations. First of all, almost always in its engagement with the Committee on the Rights of the Child, the U.S. government provides, and I quote, in the spirit of cooperation, the United States is providing as much information as possible in response to the committee's questions and comments, even in the instances where the questions or information provided in response do not bear directly on obligations arising under the optional protocol on sale, child prostitution, and child pornography. So in a way, it's a very polite way in which the government is pushing back, saying that even if we provide you some of this information, uh, we do not necessarily consider it to be our obligation uh, under the, the optional protocol. So it's very much in the spirit of cooperation that they're actually doing it. That's one. Secondly, because the convention is not ratified, the best interest of the child is not included as an obligation in US government, particularly in our engagement on child labor. So that's an important element to keep in mind. Despite all these limitations, when the US government came to the Committee on the Rights of the Child in the last round, 2016, 2017, we identified a number of issues that speak very well to some of the interventions that were made uh, by Benjamin and by Terry. For instance, as a committee, we expressed concern that the state parties legislation concerning trafficking including the Justice for Victims of Trafficking Act and the Trafficking Victims Protection Act address mainly trafficking for sexual purposes. And it actually does not adequately address the issue of trafficking for the purpose of economic exploitation. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the information that we had gathered in that review said that uh, in many cases, legislation concerning trafficking focuses exclusively on sex trafficking uh, to the detriment of uh, uh, many other issues, particularly child labor trafficking victims. Uh, for example, the, the, the Preventing Sex Trafficking and Protecting Families Act of 2014 and the Justice for Victims of Trafficking Act uh, do not address child labor trafficking. Uh, and the U.S. government's tendency uh, to treat the trafficking of adults and children uh, as being indistinguishable and to focus efforts primarily on sex trafficking uh, has actually had significant repercussions uh, on data collection, on law enforcement, and some of the limitations that we've just heard. The other issue we identified was the burden of proof uh, of force, fraud, uh, or coercion uh, under legislation against trafficking purpose imposes heavy evidential burden on the victims of child labor. In many instances, these children are actually coming from uh, communities that are ostracized, that are migrants, uh, and so forth. So this threshold of force, fraud, or coercion uh, as burden of proof was identified by the committee as being a significant uh, limitation. Now, the other point we also highlighted to the government is the insufficient regulation of the working conditions of children aged 14 and 15 years uh, in agriculture, uh, which was already highlighted. And in that regard, one of the main points that was highlighted during that review is that the absence of the requirement for parental consent in this circumstance has actually led to uh, grave violations of the rights of children, which we drew the attention of the state party. Uh, another issue that, was, uh, that we spent some time on is the wage and hour division of the Department of Labor uh, tasked with identifying unlawful labor practices was reportedly under-resourced. And as the committee, we felt that it did not prioritize the prevention of child labor party because of resource limitations. There were also concerns about the fact that the efforts to identify child victims of trafficking for economic exploitation uh, were, were limited uh, in part due to the fact that uh, training of the professionals who come in contact with uh, such children was found to be wanting. Now, let me mention a couple of points uh, uh, before I close. Lack of data on child victims of trafficking remains to be a significant challenge. The, the, the government of the U.S. actually concedes. Uh, they say that it remains to be an issue. Uh, they have tried to uh, establish a unified national data collection system, which involves a significant challenge for the United States because the federal government and state, territorial, tribal, local governments all have jurisdiction uh, in this area. Uh, and data collection is done by all authorities, 
some of whom actually use different data systems and different definitions uh, of offenses. For, for us as a committee to track progress, uh, to, to track the, the, the impact of some of the interventions that are being made, uh, to even identify the magnitude of the problem that we are talking about, which is the issue of child labor, data collection is very important. And it's not just only data collection, but disaggregated data collection uh, that we're very much uh, interested in. Now, what the US does, often has significant implications for other parts of the world. And the point about international cooperation, the role that the US plays, uh, in, not just only financially, but in a whole range of other uh, capacities has helped to address the issue of child labor, including the worst forms of child labor. So what the US does at the domestic level often has significant implications outside, but also what the US does internationally has significant implications for issues of child labor. And I'll just single out one in relation to children in armed conflict. Uh, we have the enactment of the Child Soldiers Prevention Act uh, of 2008, one of the two instruments that is aimed at implementing the optional protocol on, uh, on children in armed conflict. Uh, and the U.S. prohibits the provision of several categories of U.S. military assistance to governments that directly recruit or use uh, children. However, there is an ex exception to this. Uh, and this exception whereby the U.S. president has the authority uh, to grant full or partial so-called national interest waivers uh, in fact, for instance, in 2013 and 2017, we saw as the committee that uh, such waivers were granted to countries uh, that were uh, recruiting children, uh, that were in violation of the provisions of the optional protocol. So one can easily juxtapose this to the conversation that we're having about child labor. Quite a number of the efforts uh, that the government of the U.S. does will have significant implications, not just only domestically, but also outside of the U.S. So the ratification of the Convention on the Rights of the Child even though it's not a silver bullet, it's not an idea whose time has come. Uh, it's an idea whose time is long overdue in coming. And secondly, the full and detailed implementation of the optional protocol on sale, child prostitution, and child pornography will help us to push the boundaries for the realization of children's rights, particularly those that are victims uh, of child labor, but also for the purpose of prevention. Let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to turn to the questions from the audience for a moment. Uh, the one question related to uh, making available uh, this webinar uh, after it's over, uh, and I just want to repeat what I said earlier, uh, that it will take some time for the technological processing, uh, but that this webinar will be available on, our, on the Human Rights Program's YouTube channel uh, and the publicity for it uh, will also be uh, in the newsletter of the Human Rights Program. Uh, the other question was actually, uh, that I've received is actually related to the point that um, Benyam was making uh, just at the end uh, about US ratification of the rights of the child. Uh, it asks, uh, why is it that the United States uh, has not ratified uh, the rights of the child. Um, I'll, I'll turn that to the panel in a moment, but first I'd just like to say a couple of things about that. Uh, uh, one is that part of the issues may relate to questions of U.S. federalism uh, in a sense that the subject matter of the Convention of the Rights of the Child uh, often deals with things that are issues of state law uh, rather than federal law. Uh, and that it's difficult uh, to get support in the United States uh, for that degree of increase in federal authority. Uh, another is concerns about uh, the degree to which the Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, could be understood as interfering with legitimate parental rights. Uh, and here I want to go back actually to what I said earlier about uh, Harvard's negative role in the 1920s. President Lowell of Harvard uh, actually played a significant role in defeating uh, the ratification of a constitutional amendment that Congress had proposed to the states uh, that would have authorized Congress to deal with the issues of child labor. Uh, and part of the argument there was that uh, prohibiting child labor would interfere with legitimate rights uh, of parents. Uh, that 
led to the rejection of ratification in a referendum in Massachusetts and the fact that uh, Massachusetts, uh, which had been viewed as a liberal proponent uh, of this uh, reform, uh, rejected ratification, uh, then led to the collapse of the ratification effort uh, in the 1920s. So Harvard has a lot uh, to make up for here, uh, as in certain other areas. Uh, but this question of what, to what extent is this a parental rights issue? To what extent are parental decisions that children should work? To what extent are uh, family employment uh, legitimate uh, issues of parental rights? Uh, uh, that's something that members of the panel may want uh, to discuss in this connection also. Um, Enyam, should I go back to you first about the ratification of the convention by the United States? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jay. Uh, you have rightly addressed uh, the main reasons that we have heard why the U.S. is not a state party to the convention. Uh, as it is to be recalled, it was actually the Clinton administration uh, that signed the convention in February 1995, but they did not submit it to the uh, Senate primarily because of a strong opposition from uh, several members of Congress. Uh, now, there have been few efforts uh, further down the line. Uh, in fact, during the election of President Obama in 2008, uh, there was some uh, some refocus uh, and attention about the possibility of U.S. ratification, uh, but subsequently that also didn't pull through. Uh, now, some of the concerns about federal local uh, arguments, parental rights arguments, I have heard arguments pertaining to corporal punishment in particular, uh, which there has been re resistance to. Uh, the convention does not explicitly talk about corporal punishment, but there is Article 19, which has been interpreted by the Committee on the Rights of the Child as prohibiting corporal punishment, so that's one issue. Issues about sovereignty have been raised. The right to health care, uh, health, the right to the highest attainable standard of health has also been highlighted uh, as, uh, as one uh, reason. Now, let me just add a, a personal anecdote. Uh, in 2016, when I became chair of the Committee on the Rights of the Child, one of the things that I thought was I should actually try to engage with the U.S. government to see the possibility of ratification of the instrument. So I set up an appointment with the Zain ambassador uh, in, in Geneva, uh, and we had a conversation. Uh, but the feedback that I received was that at that stage, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities was actually not ratified. There was an effort to get it ratified, but the political atmosphere was not great. So the feeling that I received from as a feedback from the ambassador was that the political environment was not the right one. So it was not really worth uh, pushing. Uh, we tried to engage with different stakeholders to see if that assessment was right. And the feeling was that it was actually the right assessment. Uh, so we still remain with the only guilty exception, which is the US that's not a state party to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, I can add a, a comment in response to your question about parental rights um, in relation to the recent rollbacks, because the recent rollbacks in Arkansas removed the requirement of a work permit, and it was framed as sort of removing government bureaucracy and, you know, sort of a lot of kind of culture war framing of the government as bad. And we wanna you know, get the government out of decisions that are between a child and the parents and the family. Um, but in fact, the Arkansas, the, the, the work permit requirement did require the minor to actually get the parent's signature um, in order to show permission for the minor to be working. And so it's interesting when you look at this particular example, um, it, it, it just really demonstrates the way that kind of the political rhetoric that is behind all of this um, really doesn't match up with the actual substance of what is happening. Um, so, you know, there are all kinds of really wild parental rights um, moments now in relation to school curricula and really in 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 conservative states in the US and um you know parents rights are are being manipulated in a in a very concerning way but in this particular case i think it's noteworthy that if you are a parent who actually really wants to be sure that you know what your teenager is doing they just passed a law that makes it harder for a parent to do that Maybe I will um, uh, zoom out a little bit and and um, uh, on this point on on um, parental uh, 
attitudes and and and, and pushback on child labor. Um, so one thing that uh, uh, can be an obstacle in in you know uh, eliminating child labor is you know the cultural acceptance, the, the view that this work children work, it's a natural part of their uh, upbringing. Um, it's a way they learn uh, important values and, and so on. Uh, and there, I think it's important to come back to what child labor is and what it isn't. I mean, it's not household chores. There's nothing about uh, uh, children helping around the house that's that's prohibited and can be, you know, that can be positive. I think uh, uh, anyone would, would recognize that. But in some regions, uh, uh, and I'm thinking particularly in, in uh, Africa and West Africa, um, where we had pushback uh, from even government saying, uh, you know, because children helping out uh, is such a, a, a part of, of children's uh, upbringing um, that, you know, they, they will help out in the household. And sometimes the household is the same thing as the family, the small family farm. So um, we had, uh, uh, we received a, a delegation from the government of, of Ivory Coast in, in Geneva to talk this out. Uh, and we, um, you know, uh, uh, went through the provisions of the conventions. They've ratified both of our, our child labor conventions. And the end result was that they uh, concluded that there was no um, uh, contradiction between what the conventions say and what they were trying to achieve in terms of not uh, abolishing any uh, activity on the part of children. Um, that that uh, so what they ended up doing was um, um, making light work uh, available. So this is a um, under under Convention 138, a possibility to lower the minimum age from um, two years below the general minimum age. So uh, as long as that work doesn't interfere with school, is not hazardous in any way, um, and is kind of limited in in, in hours and so on. And so um, I think that oftentimes it's a question of understanding what child labor is and what child labor isn't, and the flexibility actually that is allowed under international law uh, that that um, can can help re, uh, resolve those sorts of culture th those sorts of perceived uh, um, conflict with with uh, cultural values. If I could pick, if I could just piggyback on that, um, that is something when I've been speaking in the U.S. context. One thing I always emphasize is that U.S. laws and state laws do allow minors over 14 to work. They just have these very sensible restrictions on really hazardous work and on the hours of labor. And so to the extent that there's, you know, comments about, well, the kids are just sitting on their, you know, sitting on their beds, like scrolling through their phones or, you know, that this is going to teach them to have a good work ethic and get people career ready children are able to do that, but just within the confines of jobs that don't put them at risk or their educations at risk. And I think that in the policy discussions, it's really important to kind of, and valuable to kind of scope out that, that it's, you know, in the same, you know, in the same way um, that you were just describing, Benjamin, that there are, there, there are ways that children can get you know, in any many different contexts that children can get the kind of work experience um, that don't create the real dangers that we're all concerned about. Thank you. Thanks to uh, all of the panelists. This brings us to the end of our allotted time. Uh, I think I just want to say in closing uh, that there are many difficult human rights problems in the world, some of which would be very difficult to solve. Uh, Preserving existing legal protections against child labor in the United States and making sure that there's adequate funding for their enforcement would seem to be one of the easier problems. Uh, and I hope that uh, the outrage that was sparked uh, last spring by the news accounts uh, continues uh, to spark interest uh, in preventing these rollbacks from occurring. Uh, thank you all for being here uh, and thanks to our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you.